What's going on everyone? Stained Glass Assassin. It's a beautiful day outside. I can hear all the lawnmowers going, so I hope it's nice in your neck of the woods as well. That being said, let's read some comics. I decided to go with an individual issue today. I went all the way back to 1940 and grabbed Batman issue number 5. I chose this issue for a couple reasons. One, it's a, it's a good book. But two, this book kind of marks a, uh, a jumping on point for me when I was trying to get into Golden Age comics. At the time, I was trying to read a lot of back issues, but I really wouldn't venture past the Silver Age. And then I picked up a few issues of uh, Golden Era Batman, and I was hooked. Not just on Batman, you know, but all Golden Era comics as well. So, also this book has one of my most favorite panels in Batman history. We'll see that here in a few minutes. So, this particular issue has kind of a special place in my heart. Now, as for the book itself, of course it was written by Bob Kane and Bill Finger, uh, penciled by Kane. Inks done by Jerry Robinson and George Russo, so you got kind of a legendary team here. Um, now, of course, this is a Golden Age book, so even though it's a single issue, you definitely get your bang for your buck here because there are four individual stories in this issue alone. So let's go ahead and just take a look at the first story titled Riddle of the Missing Card. All right, let's get into issue number five. Now, first, let's appreciate the Jerry Robinson cover. I really like that, the gangsters, the mobsters, and the balance there. It's a nice cover art. The first story in this is titled The Riddle of the Missing Card, and if you recognize this picture, it's very reminiscent of The Legend of Batman, the first story in issue number one, where the Joker's kind of looking over his shoulder and he's holding the cards in his hand. Uh, but what I really like about this page is the uh, miniature characters on the cards. It reminds me a lot of Justice League number one, where they have the characters on the chessboard. I always like when characters are kind of moved around on a, on a chessboard or a game pieces, something along those lines. I have no idea why, but this panel really uh, spoke to me. Anyhow, the story starts off, we see a mysterious group of people rowing a boat towards the docks at night until they hear someone crying out in the water. As they go to investigate, they find out that it's none other than the Joker. Now, in the previous issue, we saw Batman and Robin chase the Joker to a giant mansion, and as they were battling, Batman flipped Joker over, he fell through a trap door, which led to the uh, sewer system below the mansion. Of course, they thought Joker was dead, but they always think he's dead. So, in any case, uh, it turns out the group that rescued Joker is actually a band of criminals, and they have a shipment of diamonds stashed away on a gambling ship that is coming into town. They decided that since it's the Joker that they just rescued, he can serve as the brains of the operation, and of course, involving diamonds, the Joker gladly accepts. And they form the group of the Four Cards Gang. Now... In a seemingly subtle panel, we see Bruce Wayne shaving, preparing for tonight's event, which happens to be on the gambling ship, and he cuts himself. Once on the ship, the billionaire playboy sets his sights on the lovely host, who just happens to be Queenie, of the Four Cards gang. As they become acquainted, she notices the scar on his chin. How interesting. Anyhow, as Bruce steps out to catch a smoke, yeah, look, remember folks, this is 1940s. Um, things were a lot different when it came to cigarettes and smoking in general. Uh, I mean, at one point, they even had doctors recommending cigarettes. So, way different time. And as we'll see in the future, Bruce Wayne uh, smokes a pipe quite often. So, it was just the times. Anyhow, uh, Bruce overhears the Four Cards gang secretly plotting to get the diamonds and receives a whack on the head for his trouble and is tossed overboard. Once he gets back on the dry land, he gets Robin, they crash the party, which leads to a big brouhaha, and we see the Joker flee in his car. Batman gives chase, but in his haste, he drives the Batmobile right over the edge of the cliff and seemingly meets his end. In the meantime, Robin has managed to get himself captured, and while captured, the Joker uses Robin's radio to try to prove that Batman is dead. However, Batman actually answers the call and proving that he is indeed alive. So then the Joker challenges Batman to a high-stakes game of cards in which a life might be at stake. It's at this moment that Queenie realizes the cut on Batman's chin and knows that he is Bruce Wayne. Now during the game, the Joker draws both a Joker card and a gun and prepares to fire, but Batman has a trick of his own up his sleeve. He throws the cards in the Joker's face and a brawl ensues, once again seeing the Joker flee. As Batman is preparing to give chase, the Jack of Diamonds takes aim and is going to shoot Batman, but since Queenie has feelings for Bruce, she ends up shooting Jack before he can fire. Unfortunately, with his last breath, Jack shoots Queenie. As she's dying, she reveals that she knows Batman is Bruce Wayne, 
and requests one last kiss before she dies. As for the Joker, he makes his way towards a lighthouse in a boat, and this is actually the first appearance of the Batboat. It's nothing fantastic, but it is indeed the first appearance. Anyhow, once Batman and Robin arrive at the lighthouse, they battle, the Joker falls over the edge, and once again, they all think that he falls to his death. And the riddle of the missing Joker. I really like this story. It's well written. I thought the plot moves along effortlessly. You know, there's no dilly-dally. We get, you know, they find the Joker, they form the gang, set up the plot, plot falls apart, then you get the tragedy between Queenie and Batman, and then you get the battle in the lighthouse. So it's well done. Great way to start the book off. Uh, and I really like the Joker, the Golden Age Jer uh, Joker, because by issue number five, it was pretty clear that he was going to be Batman's nemesis. I know you're probably thinking Clubfoot was going to take that title, but not so much. Uh, but Golden Age Joker, and you got to also remember that Golden Age is Earth 2. Once they did a Crisis on Infinite Earths, they decided to wipe out this continuity. But here, the Joker is crazy, don't get me wrong, but he's more of just a megalomaniac. You know, he's obsessed with committing crimes, stealing uh, diamonds and rubies and those types of things. And he is a murderer, and like I said, he is crazy, but... Compared to today's really over-the-top kind of, you know, that Joker is more content on committing as much psychological horror as possible. You know, he cut your face off and go to your kid's tea party just for the shock value. So it's a stark difference, and I really do like kind of this Joker, the way it's rooted. So, uh, But all in all, great story to start the book off. But let's go ahead and take a look at the second story, which is called The Book of Enchantment. The second story, which is titled... The Book of Enchantment is a little silly, but it's a very fun read nonetheless. Uh, the gist here is that a scientist by the name of Professor Peterson has invented a machine that can transport a person into the world of any book they are reading. Uh, the professor says that he has sent his daughter Enid to the fairyland. She's, as you can see here, reading a book of fairy tales, but she has yet to return home, so he pleads for the dynamic duo's help in rescuing her. Of course, they agree, and they are transported to fairyland. Upon arriving, they meet up with Father Time, who explains that Enid has been captured by the Black Witch, and they have until sundown to rescue her and get back to their world, or they'll be trapped in Fairyland. Moments later, the Black Witch soars by on her broom and issues a warning in the form of a fire and an ice monster. The creatures are quickly dealt with, and Batman and Robin set off to rescue Enid. Of course, this being Fairyland, you know there's going to be all kinds of interesting obstacles along the way, and as we see them traveling through, through a cave, they come across a fire-breathing dragon, which Batman deals with pretty brutally. You can see here he blows up his head. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, afterwards they run into Humpty Dumpty sitting on a wall, presumably before his big fall. And he informs them that they will have to climb Jack's beanstalk in order to reach the witch's castle. Not long afterwards, they locate the beanstalk and they begin climbing, only to be captured by a giant cyclops, who naturally intends to make a meal out of them. Uh, as they escape, Batman throws a fork into the cyclops' eye, and as he's shouting, his giant cousin, the giant who I'm assuming is the, you know, giant of the beanstalk, uh, rushes in to his cousin's aid, but because the cyclops is blind, he tries to smash Batman and actually knocks out his cousin. Narrowly escaping, Batman and Robin finally reach the witch's castle, but it's surrounded by a mode of fire. Now, using the most wily coyote method of travel ever, they catapult across the moat, and they find their way into the castle. Yeah, look at that. On a tree branch like that. So, uh, Within moments of entering the castle, they fall down a set of uh, sliding trap stairs and fall right into a dungeon where a motley assortment of prisoners, including a dwarf and a goblin, instantly attack. Once Batman and Robin subdue the prisoners, they learn from the dwarf that the only way to defeat the witch is to secure her after she transforms her shape three times. So once they meet up with the witch, they start to battle. She turns into a lion. Batman defeats the lion. Then she turns into a crocodile, and then she turns into a tiger. But of course, Batman prevails and holds on tight, to which the witch loses her powers. In her disbelief, the witch throws herself over the parapet, plunging into her death. Now, realizing it's nearly sundown, Batman and Robin quickly free Enid, and they use a magic carpet to fly back to the location they arrived at, and they escape Fairyland, returning back home, living happily ever after. Ah, the Book of Enchantment. A little silly, but fun nonetheless. I'm a big fantasy guy, so to see Batman with dragons and giants and dwarves and goblins, it was right up my alley. I really enjoyed it. Um, 
And you know, a story plot like this in 2023 would seem kind of cheesy and cliched, but this is 1940, and don't forget, the year prior, a tornado came along and swept Dorothy to the land of Oz. So, shipping Batman off to the land of fairy tales is totally, you know, totally legit. So, and also, how about that dragon, right? Batman blowing up his head? Whew, pretty brutal. Now, the good thing about a story like this is it's self-contained, you know, it doesn't rely on any of the stories previously, and it doesn't affect anything moving forward, so... Read the story, enjoy it. Once it's done, it's over. You know, sometimes that's all you want out of a comic. So this kind of serves as a, um, I don't know what you would call it, maybe a palate cleanser moving forward. And that's exactly what it did. I also felt that uh, Kane and Finger missed an opportunity to kind of reference the Odyssey. Remember that scene where Odysseus tells the giant Cyclops that his name is Nobody? So when they blind him, he runs out and shouts, Nobody has blinded me! I thought the same thing was going to happen when Batman threw that fork into the giant Cyclops' eye, but more maybe I'm just a big dork. I don't know. Either way, let's go ahead and read the third story here entitled Case of the Honest Crook. The third story titled The Case of the Honest Crook is your typical kind of good guy makes a mistake by getting involved with a criminal only to learn the hard way that, you know, that crime doesn't pay, that sort of thing. Uh, in short, Batman stops a fleeing crook uh, only to learn that the man had to steal six bucks. Uh, to buy medicine for his wife. We learn that this crook's name is Joe Sands, and he once used to have a good job and was trying to save up to get married. Being only $200 short of this goal of $1,000, he decides to help a mobster by the name of Maddie Link hide his car overnight, which was involved in a crime. Uh, the mobster offers Joe 200 bucks as a reward, and blinded with his desire to get married, he hastily accepts. Upon telling his wife the seemingly good news, she helps him realize the error of his judgment, to which he agrees to inform Maddie that he cannot accept the deal. Well, Maddie's not too happy, so as payback, Maddie frames Joe, crashing into his car, pouring booze all over him, and then setting an unconscious Joe down the street behind the wheel. Once Joe finally crashes, the police arrive and are convinced that he's drunk, and then he's sentenced to two years in prison. Once out, he is unable to find work because of his criminal record, and thus is unable to afford the medicine he needs to save his wife. Determined to bring the mobster to justice, Batman loans Joe the money, and he sets off to find Maddie. Batman crashes the hideout of Maddie's boss, Smiley Sykes, and roughs up some of his goons, and then he lets Sykes know that he's looking for Maddie so that he can clear up Joe's name. When Sykes informs Maddie that Batman's looking for him, in classic mafia style, Sykes decides to have Maddie whacked to prevent him from being captured and possibly ratting to save his skin. Meanwhile, Bruce decides to visit Commissioner Gordon and sends Robin to Maddie Link's home to look for some clues. Only, Robin is ambushed by Sykes' thugs. Worried that Robin has been gone for too long, Batman rushes to Link's house only to discover a bloodied Robin. Now, Batman is, devast now, Batman is devastated at the sight of a seemingly dead Robin. However, with one last gasp, Robin alerts Batman that he is indeed alive. So Batman rushes to a nearby doctor, waking him up in the middle of the night, and demands that he helps. He even goes as far as, as, as threatening the doctor's life if he refuses to save Robin. Now, of course, the doctor agrees to help, not because of the threats, but because of his hippopotamus oath. Seething with revenge, Batman sets off to deliver swift justice and races to Sykes' hideout. Upon arriving, Batman is actually shot in the arm, but that doesn't slow him down. As he smashes through the door, Batman delivers an epic beatdown. Take a look at that. Smashing the chair, throwing around, beats the crap out of these guys. So with only Sykes left, Batman marches towards him, uh, and Sykes fires his gun, shoots him two more times. However, that doesn't stop him. And Batman subdues Sykes and forces him to sign a confession exonerating Joe Sands of his crimes. Upon returning to the doctor, Batman is relieved to learn that Bat or Robin will live, but succumbs to his bullet wounds and passes out. Luckily, the doctor is present and saves Batman and ensures him that he never peeked under his cowl and that his identity is safe. The story ends with Sans thanking Batman as his life is now seemingly back to normal. So, Case of the Honest Crook, obviously the uh, story of kind of your morals, right and wrong, obviously the uh, temptation of finding a solution, a quick solution to a problem you have. Very relatable in today's world. I mean, people succumb to their temptations and make terrible decisions which only make their problems worse so very good writing very good storytelling but of course the big takeaway for me is that whole scene with robin you know that instance where he finds robin and that panel 
where he's talking about the rage and the vengeance. For me, that's the beginning. That's where Batman becomes, you know, I am vengeance, I am the knight. That is the Dark Knight right there, because up until that point, he's never had that rage, you know. Look what he does with the Doctor. He threatens to kill the Doctor with his bare hands if he doesn't help Robin. Uh, and then I didn't show it in the, in the uh, voiceover there, but there's a panel where the crooks want nothing to do with this version of Batman. They know that they've crossed the line, so when he goes to Sykes' warehouse, they're like, well, you know, you're on your own, boss. I'm not messing with this Batman. So this transformation, I remember reading it for the first time, gave me goosebumps. And to this day, I'll take that panel, which I have to assume is the inspiration for Death of the Family 40-some years later, but I'll put that panel up against almost any modern or, you know, just any Batman panel. It's definitely top five for me. Uh, I'll always remember reading that for the first time. So, But I don't want to take away from the fourth story, so let's go ahead and cover Crime Does Not Pay. So the fourth and final story is titled Crime Does Not Pay. It's another kind of classic uh, storyline of falling in with the wrong crowd. As the story begins with Batman and Robin attempting to stop a band of robbers after having just knocked over yet another bank. Uh, as, they dispend, as they descend on the crooks, uh, they battle one another, but they flee and they manage to outrun the Batmobile. Now Batman takes particular note of one of the crooks whom appeared to be rather young to be a criminal. The next day, as Bruce Wayne, he bumps into Linda Page, whom we are introduced to for the first time. Now, Linda would uh, become a romantic interest of Bruce Wayne in about six or seven issues of Detective Comics and Batman in the future, uh, but we are introduced to her here for the first time. As Bruce decides to walk Linda home, they run into a woman who laments that her son, Tommy Grogan, has been getting into a lot of trouble lately. Linda reveals that Tommy's brother, Mike, is a gangster and that Tommy idolizes him. Just then... They witness another robbery, and as the robbers attempt to flee, one of them is shot from behind. Later that night, thugs barge into Linda's apartment and force her to come with them as one of their gang members has been shot and he needs medical attention. When they arrive at the hideout, the thug reveals himself to be none other than Mike Grogan, and it is Tommy who has been shot. Uh, meanwhile, Batman and Robin are heading over to Linda's place to see if they can get any information about Mike and Tommy, only to discover that she's missing and that she left a note alerting Batman that she has been kidnapped. Disguising himself, now this is not Matches Malone, I initially thought it was, but Matches Malone doesn't make his first appearance until Batman uh, 242, uh, but he does kind of look like Matches here. Anyhow, he disguises himself by the name of Trigger Burns, only as he approaches the gangsters and announces himself as such, they know it's a ruse because the real Trigger Burns was whacked a couple days ago. Suddenly in trouble, Robin enters the scene and the two beat up the gangsters and escape. As the thugs flee... Batman and Robin follow one of them back to Mike's hideout. Inside, the gangsters learn of the situation at hand and suspect that the cops are on their way, but they're unable to move Tommy due to his injuries. Mike suggests that the others leave and he stays behind, but one of the gangsters suggests that Mike might just rat the gang out to save his own skin. Mike is then shot just as Batman and Robin arrive. As they battle the gangsters, Tommy summons all his strength. You can see here he rolls right out of bed and climbs up to the roof and fires his gun, alerting the police to their location. Uh, just as it appears the head thug is about to shoot Batman, the cops bust in, shoot the thug, and Batman and Robin escape. Tommy, seeing his brother shot, holds him in his arms, and his brother conveys his dying wish to Tommy uh, about him, you know, getting on the straight and the narrow, to which Tommy agrees. The, the story ends with Bruce and Linda on a date in which Linda won't stop talking about Batman. If only she knew the truth. So the fourth story, The Crime Does Not Pay, probably the weakest of the four. Not to say that it's not a good story, uh, not at all. It's another believable, kind of a relatable story there. You know, you got to be careful who you idolize because idolizing the wrong person can get you into some big trouble. And obviously here, big brother Mike, involved in crime, obviously has younger brother Tommy try to follow in his footsteps. Mike doesn't realize that he's leading him down the path of danger until, well, he gets shot. And then sadly, it's not until Mike's death until Tommy realizes he needs to get on the straight and narrow and change his life. Uh, but of course, I would say probably the biggest point from this book is the introduction of Linda Page. I wouldn't call it landmark by any stretch, but if you plan on continuing on with Batman and Detective Comics, she shows up for another 10 or 11 issues. So if you want to know who she is and how they met, how they started dating, you're obviously going to run to read you know, this issue. So now, of course, that'll wrap up issue number five of Batman. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, that this book was kind of the jumping on point for me in Golden Era comics. And I think the reason is, is because I think I was a junior in college at the time. And I don't know, I guess I thought that Golden Age comics were kind of cheesy, campy. Because I think at that same year, 
Uh, my roommate got a hold of a copy of the complete 66 Batman. So we really enjoyed watching that, but I thought, is that what Golden Age comics were? You know, Batman kind of goofy dancing and all the weird costumes and things. So I had a lot of misconceptions of what Golden Age, you know, Golden Era comics were, and then I decided to pick these issues up. And then once I read this particular issue, it dispelled all those misconceptions. You know, I was hooked. I definitely wanted to get involved in Golden Era comics a lot more. So also, I mentioned earlier that you get your bang for your buck. When you read Golden Age comics, you generally get 50 plus pages of content. So definitely a lot, as you can see, four full stories here. But also, if you take a look at this page, there are eight panels on this page. Now, the average panel count is six minimum, unless the, like an intro page, you know, the cover page, you get one. But uh, but more often than not, you get seven or eight panels, and they all contain text and dialogue. Think about how many comics you've read in modern era where, I don't know, you've probably read the entire comic in seven minutes, eight minutes at most. Now, I'm not saying that good artwork can't tell a story in lieu of dialogue or text, but it's kind of a bummer that you finish the book in seven minutes. And sometimes those books are boring, though. They're kind of like, ugh, I can't believe I paid money for this. So that's not the case with the Golden Age comics. Again, there are some stories that aren't going to be entertaining, but... If you plan on sitting down and reading this from cover to cover, you better dedicate some time. Or at least in this case, you've got four separate stories, so you can read one story and then move on. Either way, there's a lot to take in here. So, But that's going to do it for issue number five of Batman. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Have you read this issue? Did you enjoy it? Did it have you know as big of an impact on you as it did for me? If you haven't read it, but you plan on, come on back. Leave a comment. I'd love to know what you think about the issue. In any case, if you liked the video, like and subscribe so you know when the next one comes out. If you didn't like the video, I still appreciate you watching. But until we meet again, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.